Welcome to Island Crimes and Mysteries. And now, it's time to join your host, Newells, for another episode. Hey guys, and welcome to another episode of Ireland Crimes and Mysteries. I want to thank you for joining me today. And if you're a returning listener, I want to say a big thank you for your continued support. If this is your first time listening to my podcast, welcome. It's great to have you on board. Now, guys, before we jump into today's episode, I want to extend a warm and enthusiastic thank you to our newest and actually our first Patreon supporter, Jackie James. You know who you are. Your support is really, really appreciated and it plays a crucial role in ensuring the future of this podcast. So a massive thank you for becoming a vital member of the community. Jackie, again, your generosity is really appreciated. And now you have the privilege of listening to the podcast a few days before everyone else. So enjoy. So without further ado, let's get started on today's story. Unfortunately, despite significant efforts and large-scale investigations down the years, we have not been successful to date in recovering Fiona. Today's case takes us to Tullamore, which is the county town for County Offaly. With a population of over 15,500 people, it is the fourth most populous town in the Midlands region of Ireland. Its most famous export is Tullamore Dew, an Irish whisky which has been distilled in the town since as far back as 1829. The Tullamore Dew Visitor Centre is on the banks of the Grand Canal, where you can take tours which focus on how they distill and produce the whisky, as well as hear a comprehensive history of the factory. It is a fun day out if you have a paunch on for whisky or even are just a casual interest. Other places of interest around Tullamore include Charleville Estate, on the edge of town, which boasts one of the most beautiful Gothic buildings called Charleville Castle, which is said to be haunted and was featured actually on an episode of Most Haunted. It is surrounded by a beautiful park, which has what is said to be one of the largest and oldest oak trees in the country, named King Oak. Tullamore is used as a base for mountain climbing enthusiasts wanting to scale the Schliebloon Mountains, which are to the south of the county. There are plenty of lively bars and restaurants in Tullamore, so all in all, plenty to see and do in this county Offaly town. It is in Tullamore that Fiona Pender was living with her boyfriend, John Thompson, in August of 1996. Fiona was born in 1971 to her parents, Sean and Josephine Pender. She had two younger brothers named Mark and John, and the family lived in Tullamore town. Fiona left the Sacred Heart Secondary School when she was 15 years old after she had completed her intercert and went on to train as a hairdresser with Cassard's Salon. She also did some part-time modelling work with her friend's modelling agency. Described as bright, attractive and of an outgoing nature, Fiona had a wide circle of friends. She was a member of the local motorcycle club and was known to be one of the better motorcyclists at the club. She came from a close-knit family, but they would be struck by tragedy in June of 1995 when Fiona's brother Mark was killed in a motorcycle accident just outside of Tullamore, leaving behind a fiancé and a three-year-old son. This, of course, left Fiona reeling as there was only two years between them and they were very close. She would never again get up on a motorbike and as a mark of respect to her brother, both she and other members of the club buried the remains of his motorbike in the Schliebloom Mountains. At this stage, Fiona was in a relationship with John Thompson after being introduced to him by her brother, who was friends with John, in October 1993. The relationship grew over a shared love of motorbikes. He was an only son, having three sisters, and came from a farming background in the neighbouring county Leash. He lived at home with his parents and worked on the family farm. He was described as the complete opposite to Fiona, being of a quiet and introvert nature. In November of 1995, they made the decision to move to London. Fiona felt she needed a change of scene after her brother's tragic loss, as no matter where she went in Tullamore, she was reminded of him. So with her parents' blessing, they made the move. John's parents weren't so understanding. 
They were not happy with him leaving them high and dry on the farm as they depended on him. Fiona had an aunt living there and she arranged a place for them to stay and also employment for them both at the Hilton Hotel in Croydon. Fiona settled right in and and enjoyed the buzz of city life, whereas John started to become homesick. He was a country lad at heart and the bright lights of London were just not for him. The relationship was starting to become strained because of this and not wanting it to end, Fiona agreed to move back home after several months in London. Shortly after the return in February of 1996, Fiona, who by now was 25 years of age, discovered she was pregnant with a due date of the 22nd of October. Fiona's parents were thrilled by the news, a ray of light after the darkness of the previous year for the Pender family. They had a brief scare in March of 1996, but after this, Fiona's pregnancy progressed without any further complications. On their return from the UK, they moved to Clamminch Street before renting a small flat on Church Street in Tullamore. The building was subdivided into 10 separate bedsits. And for the price they were paying, they were living in very cramped accommodation and had little to no privacy. The walls were so thin you could hear the conversations from the tenants in other bedsits. Despite moving back in the hopes that the relationship would improve, arguments could be heard regularly coming from their little tiny bedsit. The close quarters living situation was taking its toll and Fiona was longing for a bigger place for after the baby arrived. But some people who knew the couple were becoming more aware of the divide that was growing between them. And some even wondered was John totally committed to Fiona and their unborn baby. It didn't go unnoticed the obvious difference in backgrounds between John and Fiona either. Despite coming from a loving family, Fiona's father was unemployed a lot and making ends meet for the family was a daily struggle. This was in stark contrast to John who, as I said, came from a farming background. The family had a substantial land portfolio and John, being the only son with three sisters, was set to inherit the lot. Adding to that, he had a bachelor uncle whose farm, also substantial, was adjacent to the Thompson farm and John was in line to inherit this farm too. So any child of John and Fiona's was looking at a potential substantial future inheritance. Thursday, August the 22nd, 1996, was an ordinary day for Fiona. By this stage, she was seven months pregnant and she had arranged to go shopping for baby clothes with her mother. The two of them spent the majority of the day in Bridge Shopping Centre, which is situated in the town. They had a lovely day shopping and making arrangements for the impending birth. It had been decided that the flat in Church Street was not really appropriate for the baby as it was too small And John was working more hours on the family farm at the moment. So after the birth, Fiona would go home to her parents' house for the first few weeks until they found something more suitable. After the day of shopping, Fiona went home with her mother to the family home for a while and was chatting with her dad, Sean, about an upcoming fishing trip he was going on. She stayed there until about 7pm when they rang a taxi and her mother and her 13-year-old brother, John, made the trip with her and dropped her back to the flat. She said goodbye to them at her doorstep and told them she would chat to them the following day. According to her boyfriend John, the following morning was no different from any other. He was up around 6am to get ready for work. Fiona hadn't been feeling great and was still in bed complaining of heartburn. John said he advised her to go to the doctor and he headed off to work. Later that afternoon, Fiona's mother Josephine, who had been in town doing a bit of shopping, said she would call on her daughter as she had not heard from her since the previous evening. On arrival outside the flat, which was located at ground level, she noticed that the blinds were still down and that the place was in darkness. Assuming Fiona was resting or was out, she didn't knock. She wasn't alarmed as Fiona had told her that some of her friends were home on a visit from America and concluded she must be gone out to meet them. Her father passed by later that evening and noted that the blinds were still down and the place was still in darkness. 
Neither parent was alarmed at this stage. The following day, Saturday the 24th of August, Fiona's parents, Sean and Josephine, decided to go visit Fiona, as they still had not heard from her. So after attending Mass that evening, they walked over to the flat. Again, they found the blinds down and the place in darkness. At this stage, concern was starting to creep in. After walking the 10-minute journey home, they rang her boyfriend John out at the farm. He told him that he had not been to the flat since Friday morning, having slept at his parents' home on Friday night, and just assumed that she was staying with them. He appeared to be surprised when they told him they hadn't heard from Fiona since the Thursday evening. He agreed to come in and meet them and start looking for her. They went to the flat first with John, where Josephine noted the baby clothes that they had bought on the shopping trip, but Fiona was nowhere to be seen. She said there was no sign of a break-in either. For starters, the street the flat was on was a very busy street, even late into the night, with the front door fronting out onto the pavement. It would be extremely risky to attempt to break in without someone seeing something. The decision was then made to check the cemetery, as they thought Fiona might have gone to visit her brother Mark's grave. But she wasn't there either. At this stage, her parents were at their wits' end. And accompanied by John and their youngest son, they went to the Garda station in Tullamore at around 10pm that Saturday night. No one had seen Fiona for nearly 48 hours at this stage. They made an official missing persons report at the station. But the Garda's response was slow, to put it mildly. Garda would not visit the Pender home until the Monday. And by now Fiona was missing over 70 hours. It was now days since anyone had seen or heard from her. A search was undertaken of the flat at Church Street, as well as a detailed search of the surrounding area, including the canal, river and a local reservoir. But there was no sign of Fiona or any foul play noted to have taken place at the flat. All her belongings were still at the flat. The only items missing were a pair of white leggings, a pair of white runners and a navy t-shirt the assumption being that Fiona was wearing these clothes when she left. That Monday, the 26th of August, Gardy got in touch with local media outlets to put out a public alert for people to be on the lookout for Fiona. After that initial report, Gardy were inundated with sightings of Fiona, but the majority of these were prior to the Friday. Some were on the Friday itself, with a few saying they had seen Fiona over the weekend. All these sightings were looked into, but nothing came of any of them. One of the eyewitness reports did cause concern for the Gardaí. A man called the station saying that in the early hours of Friday morning, as he made his way home from the pub, he had witnessed two men struggling to put something very large and bulky into the back of a four-wheel drive. He described the item as looking like something that had been wrapped up in a rug. To this day, nobody has come forward to give an explanation as to what this item was. Another witness came forward stating they were nearly forced off the road on the same Friday night by a 4x4 vehicle which was heading out of Tullamore in the direction of the Schlieve Bloom Mountains at very high speed. The witness was unable to get a registration number but stated there was only one occupant in the car and said he noticed a sticker sign across the top of the windscreen which said Keep her lit. But the Gardaí were never able to find this vehicle or its owner. Now, at the time Fiona went missing, the Gardaí were made aware that she had told her little brother John something and had sworn him to secrecy. But now that she was missing, he felt he had no choice but to break this confidence and tell the Gardaí. This was not made public at the time, but he told his parents and the Gardaí that Fiona told him that during the early stages of her pregnancy she had been assaulted and a strangulation was attempted on her by someone she knew intimately. She said this person had cried like a baby after the assault, swearing they would never do anything like this again, according to the statement. This person would become the prime suspect within days and still remains the only suspect. It had not been made known publicly 
As this was the period in Ireland with a substantial amount of abductions and disappearances of women around Fiona's age profile, so Gardy could not entirely rule out that she was also a victim of an abduction and probable murder, although her family do not believe this to be the case. Her mother saying at the time, My gut tells me Fiona is somewhere where she cannot contact me. I'm afraid I fear the worst. We try and keep hope going, but as the days go on, it's very hard. Knowing Fiona as I do, she wouldn't do this to me or her family. It's out of character. Every time the phone rings, I think maybe this time it will be her. Maybe it's some news, her mother lamented. Fiona's father was still holding out hope, saying, I still believe Fiona just wanted a break. That's what I hope. On the 24th of April 1997, Gardy, along with detectives from the National Bureau of Criminal Investigation, carried out a number of searches in the Tullamore area and in the process arrested five people who were all related, three women and two men, in connection with Fiona's disappearance. They were all brought to the station in Tullamore and questioned for a number of hours. They would later be released without charge. In an interview with the Irish Times in 1997, the prime suspect openly criticised the Gardaí for arresting him and members of his family, saying the Gardaí had not taken sufficient action and did not act quickly enough in their search for Fiona. The Gardaí rebuked these claims, saying they had conducted countless searches, which included sub aqua teams, Air Corps helicopters, civil defence and tracker dogs, and continued to do so. He continued his criticism by saying the Gardaí did two searches of his farm but never searched a well located outside the door or the slurry pit. Concluding his rant by saying At the end of the day Fiona is still out there. It is up to them to find her. He continued saying It wasn't good enough that they suggest we disposed of her and leave it at that. He denied any involvement in Fiona's disappearance despite remaining the prime suspect to this day by Gardaí. In the week Fiona was due to give birth, inquiries were made to hospitals nationwide in case a woman matching Fiona's description presented herself at a hospital. A TV reconstruction was aired on RTE's crime call in the hope of jogging someone's memory. The Pender family did their best in the years that followed to keep Fiona's name out there in the hopes that a new lead would come. In 1999, Fiona's case was added to the Operation Trace case file. Then in March of 2000, tragedy would yet again come to the Pender's door. Fiona's father, Sean, who had gone into a deep depression after losing his son and then having his pregnant daughter go missing the following year, was finding it hard to cope. Heartbroken by the situation he found himself in, he could see no way out and ended his own life. His 17-year-old son making the grim discovery. This poor family have been through more heartache in a few short years than a lot of us face in a lifetime. But despite all the tragedy that had befallen them, it did not stop Josephine from pursuing the truth about what had happened to her daughter and unborn grandchild. She kept campaigning for justice, doing interviews whenever the opportunity arose. In May 2008, a person walking in Manachnew in the Schlieblue Mountains made a very grim discovery. A makeshift cross inscribed with the words Fiona Prender, buried here, Thursday, August 22nd, 1996. This area was a good distance of some 30 miles from Tullamore. The area in question was cordoned off and a forensic search expert was brought in from England to oversee the search, as well as military personnel to assist the Gardaí. Word got out to the media despite efforts by the Gardaí to keep it undercover and people descended in their droves to the area. Despite an extensive search of the area, no evidence to say that Fiona's body had ever been buried in this area was found. Was this just another sick joke by some deranged individual? The writing on the cross, according to reports, is unique and the cross has been preserved as evidence in the hope that the author of those words will be located in the future. No motive for the existence of the cross has ever been established. 
Was it just symbolic or is there a more sinister aspect to it? Gardaí remain open to the possibility that Fiona's remains could have been there at some point, but equally they are not ruling out the possibility that this was nothing but a cruel hoax. In 2012, Fiona's boyfriend, following battles in court to do with his inheritance of both family farms, decided to emigrate abroad with his then partner. Then in August 2014, Gardaí were made aware of a case in Saskatchewan in Canada, which involved a man from County Leash. This man was accused of sexually assaulting his wife and threatening to kill her. The Gardaí would soon be made aware that this man, now a truck driver in Canada and a biker enthusiast, was actually the man who is the prime suspect in Fiona's alleged abduction and murder and one of the five people previously arrested and questioned in 1997, who were later released without charge. Gardy travelled to Canada and spoke with his wife, who was in protective custody at the time. She told them that he had previously revealed to her that he was actually responsible for Fiona's abduction and murder. He had threatened her that if she ever opened her mouth to anyone about what she had been told, she would end up like her. She went on to tell the Gardaí that in the early days of their relationship around 2004, he had brought her to the Schliebloom Mountains and while there told her that he had buried a woman there that had been missing for some years. This was in a wooded area in Capard, which is near Rosenalis County Leash. This area had been previously searched by Gardaí, but no evidence of a burial was ever found. Then in October 2015, a judge-only trial was held in Canada for the alleged assault by this man on his wife. But he was found not guilty as the judge found there was no evidence of the acts of alleged assault being non-consensual, despite having video evidence. They are now divorced, with his now ex-wife saying that he informed her after they split that he had no intention of ever returning to Ireland. He went on to tell her that he was investing whatever money he had left in gold and silver and planned on living off-grid, building a bunker in the woods around Saskatchewan, saying he wanted to be away from people before the world's economy collapsed. He would later attempt to sue the Canadian authorities for wrongful arrest, but the case was thrown out. Gardaí now believed that the information that the suspect had given to his partner was no more than a ruse. When they first got this information, they had been hopeful it would lead to the discovery of Fiona's remains, as the information given tallied with other information they had received in the early days of the investigation regarding the car being forced off the road by a 4x4 outside Tullamore, going in the direction of the mountains, and the witness seeing two men struggling to put a large object that looked like it was wrapped in a rug into a 4x4. An extensive search of the area covering a strip of land around 200 metres in length was carried out and cadaver dogs were also utilised in the search, but to no avail. On the 13th of September 2017, Fiona's mother Josephine passed away at the age of 68, after being ill for some time, leaving Fiona's brother John as the sole survivor of the family. After his mother's death, John, who has vowed to continue the fight for truth and justice for his sister Fiona, said both of his parents died of broken hearts. He appealed for a full Garda review and a cold case review of his sister's case. He went on to say that there is only one chief suspect in his sister's disappearance and that has never changed in all of the years. This being the suspect who emigrated to Canada and was at the centre of the abuse case. John went on to thank the suspect's wife for having come forward with the information about what he allegedly said regarding Fiona. He called her brave and strong for coming forward. He said that he and his mother both believed her, saying his mother always said that she never wanted any other woman to suffer the way Fiona had in order to bring him to justice. Sadly, he said... This woman had suffered. Having been cleared of the charges in Canada, John said he believed this man was now in a new relationship in another jurisdiction. Going on to say, quote, Life for him carries on. 
while my whole family was destroyed. My mother and father died of a broken heart and I have only been able to say goodbye to the one member of my family, my mother, who passed away from natural causes, while no one else in my family did. It has been a struggle over the years, but now the torch has been passed to me to find my sister. Fiona was um, a really fun sister to have, looking back, you know, I have nothing but good memories of uh, a childhood with her. She was bright and bubbly and... Um, she always had a bit of a, a bit of a smile on her face. She had a lot of love in her, you know. It certainly took its toll on the family, and the most heartbreaking thing was seeing the stress that it, it caused in the house. Seeing how it aged my dad it affected him terribly. After his mother's death, he revealed a letter written by his mother to Fiona in 2011, which was read out at Josephine's funeral by Fiona's friend. In the letter, she writes. When we lost your brother Mark on the 12th of June 1995, you said to me, Nothing worse can happen to us now, ma'am. We did not know then that 14 months later we would lose you and your baby on the 22nd of August 1996 and your dad on the 31st of March 2000 from a broken heart after losing his children. When I lost you, Fee, my firstborn, my beautiful only daughter, I lost my best friend, with whom I could discuss anything. My shopping companion. You had such a flair for fashion. Oh, the shoes and handbags we would have bought together, Fee. She went on to say that she believed Fiona and her baby were now in heaven and begged her to help find their mortal remains here on earth. The letter continued. I hope you are in the light now, Fee, as I know you did not like the dark. I also hope your feet are warm. Oh, how I long to rub them for you as we did when they were cold. I greatly regret not being able to help you on the birth of your baby, my grandchild. My heart and arms ache never to be able to hold and look after your baby. Ask God to help John and myself, the only two members of your family left, to give us the strength to keep going after the loss of you, our loved ones. The letter in itself is heartbreaking. Josephine died mere weeks after the 21st anniversary of Fiona's disappearance. Fiona, like all the other cases of missing women from the 1990s, are collectively grouped together in the high-profile inquiry by Gardy, known as Operation Trace, and are essentially frozen in time. Whenever we think of them, we see a grainy picture of them in our minds, like the grainy photos of them in the media. They were from a time before digital photos, JPEGs and HDR. A time before social media and instant news. All missing, presumed dead. But where are they? And who made them disappear? In some cases, maybe it was the same person. But in others, it was someone else. Probably someone known to them. Which is believed to be the scenario in Fiona's case. From the beginning, there has really only been one suspect. This suspect is known to Operation Trace and was probably aided in covering up his crime by those closest to him. The five people that were originally interviewed and let go. They most likely hold the key to finding Fiona and the answer to the burning question, what happened to Fiona and her baby? So why can't justice be served? Other cases with nobody have been successfully tried. This person not only took Fiona's life, but also that of her unborn child, as well as inadvertently leading to the death of Fiona's father, who was so grief-stricken he felt he couldn't go on. Every year a new appeal is made on the anniversary of her disappearance for people who may have had contact with or saw Fiona on the morning of the 23rd of August 1996 to come forward. But nothing new has come to light that we know of. A monument designed by her brother John now stands in memory of Fiona on the banks of the Grand Canal in Tullamore, described by John as the next best thing to a gravesite for her. Each year on the anniversary, the Fiona Pender Memorial Walk and Run follows a route along Fiona's Way, a stretch of the canal walk named after her to remember Fiona and keep her memory alive in people's minds. Fiona was, at the time of her disappearance, seven months pregnant. 
described as five foot, five inches tall, with long blonde hair. The last confirmed sighting of Fiona was outside her flat on Thursday, the 22nd of August, 1996, by her mother. If you have any information on the disappearance of Fiona, please contact Tullamore Garda Station on 057 9327600 or the Garda Confidential Line on 1800 666 111. Or alternatively, you can contact your local Garda station. So guys, that's it for today's episode of the Ireland Crimes and Mysteries podcast. Again, thanks for your listenership. And don't forget to subscribe to the show and hit that auto download so you never miss an episode. Until the next time, keep your eyes open and your mind curious. This podcast has been compiled from information gathered in the public sphere like news articles, documentaries and open source material that can be found on the web. Everything in this podcast is alleged unless a conviction has taken place. You've been listening to Ireland Crimes and Mysteries. Join Newells for another episode coming real soon. And keep up to date by following our social media sites, our YouTube channel and our website islandcrimesandmysteries.ie